Good evening to you all and welcome. I'm Deborah McPhee, Dean of Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service, and I will serve as the Master of Ceremonies for this virtual endowed chair installation for the Marianne Caronta Chair for Social Justice for Children and the James R. Dumpson Chair in Child Welfare Studies. The Caronta Chair honors the life and legacy of Dr. Marianne Caronta, a member of the Graduate School of Social Service, class of 1950, who was widely recognized for her important and pioneering contributions to social work education and practice. Dr. Caronta served as Dean of Fordham, of Fordham Graduate School of Social Service from 1975 to 2000. During her tenure, she transformed the school from a small local school to a school of national prominence. She also established the school's doctoral program in social work. Following her retirement in 2000 as Dean, Dr. Caronta served as provost of Marymount College until 2004. She continued to serve the public good until her passing in 2009 at the age of 83. The purpose of the Caronta chair, which was established by Fordham and generously funded in part by many of Dr. Caronta's family members and friends is to increase and enhance opportunities for children who are deprived of the basic elements of healthy development and well being. The chair's primary goal is to be a focus of change for a fragmented system of child and family services with the expectation that these changes will influence the development of healthy children, families, and urban communities. The Dumpson Chair was established to honor the critical work of Dr. James R. Dumpson whose career was distinguished by outstanding advocacy and public service on behalf of children. From 1967 to 1974, Dr. Dumpson held the position of professor and served as Dean of Fordham University's Graduate School, School of Social Service. As Dean, he led a dramatic shift in the makeup of the faculty, expanding it in terms of background, interest and experience. Leveraging his strong ties to government, Dr. Dumpson strengthened the university's connection to the city and the state. Dr. Dumpson passed away in 2012 at the age of 103. He was posthumously inducted into Fordham University's Hall of Honor in 2016 in recognition of his life of service that exemplifies the ideals to which the university is devoted. For more than 40 years, the Dumpson Chair has honored the, <coughs> excuse me, has honored the lifetime commitment of Dr. Dumpson to children by utilizing the full educational and research resources of the university as a means to improve the quality of life for vulnerable children, especially those in New York City. In 1981, he became the first to fill it, the, the chair, permanently solidifying his Fordham legacy as a dedicated public service, which endures to this day. As we move into the ceremonial portion of, evening, of this evening's program, we encourage you all to ask questions at any time throughout the chair holders presentations by using the Q&A, the question and answer function located at the bottom toolbar of your Zoom window. When submitting your questions, kindly distinguish to, which, or to whom the question is directed unless it applies to both chair holders. We will certainly do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the time we have at the end of the presentations. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the president of Fordham University, the Reverend Joseph M. McShane of the Society of Jesus. Thank you very much, Dean McPhee. I'm honored to welcome all of you, Fordham alumni, friends, and esteemed guests to the virtual installations of the Graduate School of Social Services, Coranta and Dumpson Chairs. The noble mission of these two university chairs is to improve the lives of vulnerable children in New York City and beyond. Children, the future leaders and the change makers in our world, are the special and worthy beneficiaries of the shareholders' unique, determined, and extraordinary scholarship and endeavors. For my part, I can think of two, I can think of no greater mission than that. This evening, we recognize two outstanding educators and social justice advocates, Dr. Shirley Gatanio Gable and Anne Williams Isom. Dr. Shirley Gatanio Gable is a senior professor at Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service. She received her Master of Social Work, Master of Philosophy, and Doctor of Philosophy degrees from Columbia University. 
and she has twice been awarded Fulbright scholarships to study child and family policies. Her important research focuses on human rights and social policies, particularly those affecting children. Prior to joining the world of academia, Dr. Cadenio Gable worked on children's issues as a child care worker, a case worker in child welfare, policy and legislative analyst, lobbyist and community organizer in both public and private organizations. She has importantly served as a consultant to UNICEF, UNESCO and United Nations member countries on child poverty and advocacy strategies and social protection in developing countries. She is the editor of a book series on applying rights-based approaches to social work practice. She authored a rights-based approach to social policy and is the co-founder and co-editor of the new Journal of Human Rights and Social Work. She received the Council on Social Work Education Partners in Interna International Education Faculty Award in 2018. In recognition of your thoughtful and groundbreaking scholarship, and your service within your field, and on behalf of the human family. Dr. Catania Gable, Fordham is proud and delighted you, delighted to welcome you to the Mary Ann Caranta Chair for Social Justice for Children. We present you with this Distinguished Chair Medal to acknowledge your position as a most accomplished researcher, educator, and mentor, and to signify your special place within the Fordham educational community. Congratulations, doctor. It is a great, great honor to have you as such a distinguished and recognized member of the faculty. You are now an endowed professor, which is the highest rank that the university has among its faculties. Congratulations. Thank you, Father McShane. Now, Anne williams Isom. Anne williams Isom is a graduate of Fordham College at Lincoln Center, a member of the class of 1986. She has dedicated more than 20 years to serving New York City's most vulnerable children and families. After earning her bachelor's degree from Fordham in political science and psychology and a Juris Doctorate from Columbia Law School, Ms. williams Isom worked in leadership at New York City's Administration for Children's Services. <clears throat> She concluded her tenure as Deputy Commission, Commissioner for the Division of Community and Government Affairs, where she oversaw the implementation of several initiatives, including the first ever ACS Leadership Academy for Child Protect Protection. Ms. williams Isom also served as a Chief Executive Officer for the Harlem Children's Zone, where she oversaw all programs in the Cradle Through College Pipeline and strengthen the organization's use of data to improve services and outcomes for 25,000 children and adults in central Harlem. In January 2016, she was appointed to Mayor Bill de Blasio's Children's Cabinet Advisory Board and selected to be a member of the spring 2016 cohort of the Aspen Bahara Education Fellows Program. In May 2018, she, see, she received an honorary doctorate from Fordham, her alma mater. In October 2019, she was chosen as one of the Nonprofit Power 100 by City and State Magazine, and she was chosen as one of the 2020 Education Power 100 in February 2020. Currently pursuing her doctorate in ministry, Ms. williams Isom exemplifies her commitment to Cura Personalis, one of the central tenets of Jesuit education. Ms. Ison Williams, in recognition of your thoughtful and groundbreaking scholarship and service within your field and on behalf of the entire human family, Fordham is proud and delighted to welcome you to serve as the James R. Dumpson Chair in Child Welfare Studies. It is my great honor on behalf of everyone at Fordham, especially the Dean and faculty of the Graduate School of Social Service to present you with this distinguished chair medal to acknowledge your position as a most accomplished researcher, educator, and mentor, and to signify your special place within the Fordham educational community. Thank you so much, Father. 
And on be, I mean this from the heart, as I say this to both of you, on behalf of the entire Fordham University community, faculty, staff, students, alumni, alumni, donors, board of trustees, I wanna thank you for your unparalleled dedication to serving those who are most in need and for dedicating your lives, not only to the protection, but to the cultivation of hope in the hearts of children, especially children who have been forced by circumstance to live at the margins of society. You have helped them, you have helped them beyond imagining to discover within themselves strengths, talents, and dreams. Congratulations. We are blessed and fortunate to have you as members of our community. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Father McShane. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your wonderful presentation to our new chairs. Please allow me to extend my heartfelt congratulations to both Shirley and to Anne on behalf of the Graduate School of Social Service. It is now my pleasure to introduce Marianne Caranta's daughter, Dr. Mary, Ann, Dr. Mary Beth Morrissey, who will share some remarks about her mother's legacy and welcome Dr. Dr. Shirley Catania Gable to deliver her inaugural presentation as the Caranta Chair. Thank you, Dean McPhee and Father McShean, and good evening. On behalf of my late brother, the Honorable Kevin J. Caranta, and myself, and the Caranta, Morrissey, and O'Connor families, I thank Fordham University and the Graduate School of Social Service for establishing this chair in my mother's name and inviting me to participate in the chair installation this evening. I take a moment to congratulate the family of Dr. James Dumpson, with whom my mother enjoyed a warm and collegial relationship throughout their time at Fordham. My mother would be pleased to share the stage this evening for the Caranta and Dumpson chair installations. Throughout her career, my mother was a staunch advocate for social justice for children and families, beginning with her early career experience as a caseworker at the Kennedy Home and later in her roles as faculty in the GSS MSW program and as director of fieldwork. In that capacity, she strengthened the school's relationships with the network of social service and child welfare agencies throughout the city. Notably, my mother served as Dean of Fordham University's Graduate School of Social Service for 25 years, the longest serving Dean in Fordham's history. During her tenure as Dean, she expanded and strengthened the school's research programs in mental health, children and families and aging and established the school's doctoral program in so social work. On a national level, Dr. Coranta chaired the Accreditation Commission of the Council of Social Work Education, where she stressed the importance of fieldwork experience and commitment to vulnerable populations. She also served as president of the National Association of Social Workers and president of Catholic Charities USA. And in such capacity, greeted Pope John Paul II in 1987 on his first visit to the United States. She received many honors in recognition of her important work, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Council on Social Work Education her work on the national stage helped cultivate the school's reputation as one of the nation's leading graduate schools of social work, marked by the school's rise to 11th in the national rankings. My mother's legacy at Fordham and in wider communities of social work education and practice and child welfare lives on through the Quaranta Chair and the countless graduate school of social service alumni whom she inspired to dedicate their lives in the service of those most vulnerable, especially children. It is now my great honor to introduce the Caranta Chair, Dr. Shirley, excuse me, Shirley Gatenio Gable. Dr. Gatenio Gable's advocacy for the protection and welfare of children, their families and communities aligns with the values my mother held dear and positions her as an indisputable choice to serve as the Caranta chair holder. 
an expert in children's rights and human rights-based policy and practice. Dr. Gatenio Gable was named the Caranta Chair in September 2019. She brings her considerable expertise to the promotion of multidisciplinary research, focusing on international comparative child and family policy, early childhood programs and policies, and policy implementation. I am now pleased to introduce the Caranta Chair, Dr. Shirley Gatenio Gable, for her inaugural presentation, Seeking Social Justice for Children. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you, and a big welcome to all of you joining us this evening. I am honored and very excited to be here. I would like to thank Father McShane and of course my colleague and the Dean of the Graduate School of Social Service, Deborah McPhee, for the honor of being named the Marianne Caranta Chair for Justice for Children. I thank Mary, Mary Beth Morrissey and her family for establishing this important endowed chair and will work hard to bring increased honor to your mother's legacy through this chair. As the child of refugees whose suitcases were not filled with family heirlooms, but with dreams for creating a better world for their children, I am humbled and proud to be here today and see this honor as an opportunity to further my parents' dreams. I would also like to congratulate Jerry and Donald Dumson and my new colleague, Ann Williams Isom, on her appointment as the Dumson Chair. It has been a pleasure to work with you, Anne, and I hope our collaborations will grow bigger and bolder over time. The increased polarization or the increasingly polarized world we are living in has created two very different scenarios regarding the direction of our society. And it begs the question, what is justice? We tend to relegate justice to a pedestal far above our everyday lives, yet justice is not absolute. It is fluid and is always in the eye of the beholder. Justice is defined by our ethnocentrism and in cultures that include subcultures, it is often the dominant viewpoint or the view of those who control the culture that is used to inform a culture's definition of justice. Justice to a marginalized community may look very different than the dominant culture's view of justice. No solution to justice is perfect, and we continually update our sense of justice as new ideas enter a culture. Cries for justice often emerge from the tension over conflicting perspectives. And when people can advance claims to opportunities, resources, and fairness. In contrast, when people's interests converge and resources are bountiful, we reallocate without cries for justice. The benchmark we use for just treatment of children will be different depending on the period and the cultural conflicts of the time. For example, it was considered just in ancient Rome for parents who could not afford to raise their children to leave infants in recognized spots in the woods where they would either die or be collected and raised by strangers. Emperor Constantine outlawed this infant abandonment in 1313 and replaced it with a law allowing fathers to sell their children. The new law saved many infants' lives, but created other issues until the sale of children was outlawed in 374. It is no surprise then than during times when two very different visions for our country prevail we hear loud resonating calls for justice. My intention for us this evening is to show you how we evolving concepts of justice for children in the US have deliberately sidestepped issues of race. And I argue that we can no longer do so 
if we want to usher in a more equitable and inclusive future for children. As we approach the 20th century, the middle class in American society grew, and so did dreams of replicating upper income family lifestyles, including reducing the number of wage workers in a family. Having a wife who did not work and spent her time at charity and social meetings was a sign of prosperity. And yet keeping children out of work was out of reach for millions of children whose families barely survived on the low wages their parents earned. It was during this time too that reformers were advocating for society to carve a distinct period in life called childhood. Childhood would be distinguished as a period when children were to be nurtured, educated, and loved. A time when the lives of children would be dedicated to growth and not to production. Childhood already had become an accepted period of life for the US wealthy and emerging class. The challenge was for it to be a distinct period in life for all children. Justice at the turn of the century, at least in Western societies, focused on accepting this new social construct known as childhood. Leading the fight for government and societal reform during this period were social work pioneers. In major cities across the United States, these reformers known as child savers created an unprecedented movement that sought to protect children from physical and moral harm by pursuing extensive child-centered reforms in the name of justice such as creating laws on child labor, child welfare, and mandating schooling, creating child health bureaus and playgrounds and summer camps, and providing cash assistance for children. One of the chief reforms of the child savers was the establishment of a juvenile justice system. The reformers knew that economic and racial differences were key factors but chose to ignore the racial issues in the new systems they were creating. Many scholars have questioned whether the reformers were acting in the best interest of children or whether the intent was to extend government control over children of the poor. This is a reoccurring issue in justice for children because children almost have no choice but to rely on adult sense of justice for children. By the 1950s, middle-class families headed, headed by wage-earning husbands became the ideal. It had taken a war and decades to create this family model as the norm. And though it was short-lived, the images of a homemaker mom attending to her husband and children have stayed with us for decades and became the standard by which all families were judged. This ideal masked the growing disparities in our society. In 1964, the Moynihan Report sought to address the growing poverty rates among black children and why during a period of remarkable economic growth, more blacks were out of work in 1964 than in 1954. The report attributed the rising poverty of black children to the high incidence of single parenthood amongst blacks. Despite the controversy around the report, it framed the national discussions about poverty and shaped all welfare reform efforts since then. Becoming pregnant repeatedly outside of marriage was framed as a personal choice. Justice for children in the 1960s translated into ensuring that all children should have a two-parent married couple home, once again, dodging systematic racism in our society. So where has ignoring race led us? 
Well, I'd like to share a few graphs summarizing these consequences. But you'll see the first thing you need to note here is that while in 1980, the majority of children were non-Hispanic whites, the majority of children in the United States are no longer non-Hispanic white children. By 2040, non-Hispanic white children will be 43% of the child population. The likelihood of living in a two-parent married couple household has decreased somewhat for white, black, and Hispanic children, but has varied consistently by race and ethnicity. All children are much more likely to be poor if they live in a family headed by a single mother. When we combine race, ethnicity with family structure, we see that black children are three times more likely to live in deep poverty, poverty, or in low income households than white children. Hispanic children are two and a half times more likely. Over the past 30 years, the average wealth of white families has grown by 84%, three times faster than the growth rate for black families. It would take 228 years for the average black family to build the wealth of the average white family under current economic trends. Justice would be accepting different family forms and giving children what they need regardless of the family structure rather than judging them by the dominant white structure. Children living in poverty are vulnerable to environmental, educational, health, and safety risks and are more likely to complete, complete fewer years of school and experience more years of unemployment. Children who are born to poor parents are more likely to be born at low birth weights. They have higher risks of infant mortality and are more likely to grow up in homes that offer lower levels of economic, emotional, and cognitive support. Recent research has found that Black and Hispanic children are more likely to contract the coronavirus, have complications, and be hospitalized than white children. Black newborns are three times more likely to suffer complications or die when cared for by white doctors compared to black ones. And black children are six times more likely to be shot to death by the police than white children. If there is any doubt of enduring racism and its effects, look at these two charts. The first one you're looking at shows us the concentration of slavery in the United States in 1860 at the community level. Darker the color, the greater the concentration. The next one, shows us the concentration at the community level of deep poverty or disadvantage in 2020. For a long time, we have chosen to avoid confronting the root causes of injustices and chosen instead to blame our victims for poor choices. In turn, the disparities increased among children and we became frustrated by the stubbornness of the situation. Over 100 years ago, we realized that we needed to create new systems if we wanted justice for all our children. Over the past century, we have attended to many of the factors that affect child well being education, child labor laws, disabilities, family structure, et cetera. Our cries for justice for children today rest on our, on our ability to build new anti-racist systems in social services, education, law, health, and law enforcement. 
Only when new systems are implemented will we be able to bring justice to all children in this country. Thank you. Dr. Shirley Catania Gable, thank you so much for your compelling inaugural pr presentation. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. James Dumpson's daughter, Jerry Wade, who will say a few words about her father, and also Dr. J. Donald Dumpson, his nephew, who will share some remarks about his uncle's legacy and welcome Anne Williams Isom to deliver her inaugural presentation as the Dumpson Chair. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Father McShane, for the wonderful celebration and installation of Anne Williams Isom as the James R. Dumpson Chair in Child Welfare Studies. I want to take a moment to thank Fordham University and the Graduate School of Social Service for keeping my father's incredible legacy alive by thoughtfully selecting shareholders with extensive experience, diverse perspectives, and above all, a passion for ensuring current and future generations of vulnerable children are protected. My cousin Donald and I are thrilled to welcome Anne Williams Isom to the, as the new Dumpson Chair. Anne's deep New York City roots, personal and spiritual connection to Fordham, combined with her lifelong dedication to serve others, makes her an ideal candidate to follow in my late father's footsteps. He would be thrilled and immensely proud. And with that, I now hand things over to my cousin, Dr. J. Donald Dumpson, who will speak more about my father's legacy and Ann Williams Isom, the new Dumpson Chair in Child Welfare Studies. Thank you so much, Jerry. Good evening, everyone. My name is J. Donald Dumpson. I'm honored to be here to celebrate my uncle's trailblazing legacy by welcoming another trailblazer Anne Williams Isom as the Dumpson Chair, who is an adamant and outspoken advocate for people on welfare, particularly children. For 65 years, Dr. James Russell Dumpson humbly served as a social worker, broke barriers for others as well as for himself. Before joining the Fordham University faculty, Dr. Dumpson held prominent positions in the administrations of five New York City mayors. In 1959, he was appointed the first Black welfare commissioner in US history and the first social worker to oversee welfare in New York. In 1967, his appointment as Dean of the Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service made him the first Black Dean of a non-Black school of social work in the country. At home and abroad, Dr. Dumpson never quit fighting for those in need. He repeatedly traveled overseas for, for the United Nations and other national organizations to help set up social work programs. Dr. Dumpson received numerous awards and recognition of his service including five honorary academic degrees and the Distinguished Service Medal from the Council on Social Work Education, of which he served as president for two years. Now to Ms. Ann Williams Ison. She was appointed to the Dumpson Chair last September and has hit the ground running to develop research programs and policy analysis that improve services to at-risk children and families. As chair, she will, set, she will create a Dumpson Fellowship for a team of four diverse students who will work with her on projects related to racial equality, child welfare, and social justice. The students will work to develop programming, assist in research, design a series of workshops for community leaders to work toward dismantling systemic racism, create tools for practitioners to support anti-racist practices in their agencies develop measures of accountability, and develop mechanisms for ongoing innovation and sustainability. Ms. Ann Williams-Isom is well on her way to following in my uncle's footsteps, 
leveraging her robust personal experience and professional expertise to forge her own path to improve the lives of children and families in challenging circumstances. It is therefore my honor to introduce the Dumson Chair, Anne Williams Isom, for her inaugural presentation, A New Beginning, Reimagining Family and Children's Services. Oh my goodness, Donald and Jerry, I feel so emotional. Jerry, I'm looking at you and I'm so happy, so blessed to be here. And I'm so thankful for both of you and for this introduction. I also want to give a special shout out, if she's out there, to Dr. Al McCartan, who I know is such a special part of your family. And really, for so many of us African-American women, particularly in this field, we don't have enough role models. So I want to give a shout out to Dr. Carton. Thank you, Dean McPhee, for all that you've done for your leadership. I am here because of you and wanting to have the opportunity to work with you. Thank you and congratulations to uh, my partner in crime, Professor Gable. I'm really looking forward to us working together. And last but not least, Father McShane, for your leadership, your love, and your, vi your vision, not just for the Fordham community, but for our brothers and sisters in the Bronx, who I know that need us so much. So Father McShane, you're in this first story of mine. So if some of you know, I talk about my mom a lot. My mom came to this country from Trinidad and Tobago. She was one of 14, she was the youngest of 14 and her mom died in childbirth with her. And so the brother before her, my uncle Frankie was two at the time and when my mom was born, my grandfather couldn't take care of her. So my grandfather took my mom and uncle Frankie to live with the nuns at the convent in Port of Spain. I guess that was their version of foster care in 1930. My mom turned 90 in October. And when I shared this story with Father McShane, I don't know, he did some uh, priestly like thing and did some research and was able to find out right away that it was the Dominican nuns that came from France to Trinidad. They actually came in the 1800s and settled there. And then in 1921, they um, went and they settled in a, uh, to take care of lepers. Yes, I said lepers in a leper colony and then ran um, the orphanage where my mom grew up. So yes, women of God raised and cared for my mom so that she could have an opportunity for a better life. And even though I know that the nuns were loving, I can't spend much time thinking about my mom growing up in an institution. So there were no pictures on the first day of school, no hugs from her mother, no endless making of cookies as I did with my kids during this past Christmas we know what her life must have been like. Don't get me wrong, I thank God that she was raised by people who were led by the light of Christ. But if you let that sink in for a minute, if you let it into your spirit, we know in our hearts that children should not grow up in institutions. So when I thought about this presentation today, I want us to think about what are the other things that we're doing right now that 50, 60 years from now, we are gonna say to ourselves, why did we do that? What we knew that that was not right for children. So service is not just the flavor of the month for me, it is in my DNA. And when I talk about childhood trauma and long-term effects on vulnerable children, I know it because I know it firsthand. When I talk about poor maternal outcomes for women of color, I think of my grandmother, but I also think about my two daughters who may wanna be mothers one day. And I don't want them to walk into a labor room and see a white doctor and feel like they're not gonna be able to have a healthy baby. So my interest in disparities based on racial inequities and adding to the research and more importantly, helping to support anti-racist practices and social services is my passion. When I talk about the fear of police brutality, I didn't have to watch television this summer. I remember when I found out that I was having a boy and how I cried because I wondered how this world was gonna accept this beautiful baby boy of mine. And to this day, when my 25 year old son, Philip walks out the door, I feel that fear. So justice is not just a passing interest for me. This is why there has never been a more important moment to really breathe life into this Dumpson chair and to make sure that others understand what I'm gonna call Dr. Dumpson's prophetic vision. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to know Dr. Dumpson. So I've been delving into his work and I actually even went on an archive um, from the history makers, which so I got to hear him in his own words, which was pretty fantastic. 
And Donald, I don't think you said this part, but he started as an educator in Philadelphia and then moved to New York when he got an offer from the Children's Aid Society, saying that education and social work were brother sister um, professions because they both worked for the best, best interest of children. So in 1959, when Dr. Dumpson became what they called the commissioner of the Department of Welfare at the time, he had three main goals. He wanted to make sure that he was increasing the amount of people of color who were in the profession, increase professionalism of the workforce, and then to bring public and voluntary agencies together in closer collaboration. So as a black woman who has really risen to positions of leadership in government and in the nonprofit field, I am Dr. Dumpson's legacy. I think he would be proud today. I also know how important and how serious sitting in this chair is at this time, especially today when the world is in such turmoil and his vision has yet to be realized. Dr. Dumpson would have never imagined how much work we still have to get done. My colleague went over the data, so I don't have to go over it with you, but I'm going to just say some things so that we can make sure that we heard it. She said that there were 12 million children living in poverty today making them the poorest age group in America. Black children are already disproportionately represented in America's poor with 32% black children living in poverty compared to 11% of white children and 26% of Hispanic and Latinx children. And according to the US Census Bureau, black children born into poverty are twice as likely as white children to stay there. And if we wanna bring it a little closer to home, let's talk about a recent report that came out from the Citizens Committee of, for Children entitled Child and Family Wellbeing in New York State that stated that a total of 835, 815 children statewide live in households below the federal poverty line. Now listen, there are a host of historical and systemic reasons for this, but the reasons that I've been focusing on recently has been the unemployment rate of black women and the lack of household wealth that black families have. And my colleague talked about that in her talk. There is so much work to be done still, my brothers and sisters. More than 72% of Latinx and Black fourth and eighth grader students are not proficient in math and reading. And that was before the pandemic. I recently did an essay with a colleague for the Urban Law Journal of Fordham University Law School, which talks about the inequities and the disparities that we're seeing right now as a result of the pandemic in an already pretty segregated New York City public school system. According to a recent report in the United Hospital Fund, in New York State, 4,200 children have lost a parent due to COVID-19, and 325,000 children have been pushed into or near poverty because of the pandemic's economic downturn. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because think about the toxic stress that those children are experiencing. And it's not gonna be for 12 or 18 months, it's gonna be for their lifetime. So making it so much more important that we have good competent mental health services available in communities for children. As chair, I will research systemic approaches to toxic stress and collective trauma and develop models and policy recommendations about creating emotional wellness initiatives like we did at the Harlem Children's Zone. I did an article last week that uh, last month for a chapter in a book about race and mental health and the effects of that, I, we can't even imagine and we're gonna have to get some work done. As a matter of fact, my dissertation as I pursue my doctorate in ministry is about these issues. And lastly, we know from Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago that the recent rise of unemployment due to COVID-19 has increased the risk of maltreatment for children and it, thank God it looks like the most serious cases were caught, but we know that there's so much more that we need to be doing with community services to make sure that those kids have support. And, and let me just make sure that I say this. Children involved in the child welfare system in this country are some of the most vulnerable children, period. And there is much more that we need to be enduring, enduring to make sure that they are safe, stable, and that they have lives full of, of beautiful, wonderful things that they deserve. I was talking to a colleague recently and we were talking about kids in foster care and they were talking about GEDs and vocational um, programs. And I said, okay, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't imagine a black 21 year old out there on their own making a living wage based on that. I get it. 
I wonder if some of the things that we're doing with kids in foster care now are gonna be those things that we look back 60 years from now and said, how did we ever think that that was possible? There is so much work that we need to get done. As we sit on this Zoom right now, how many children are going to sleep hungry tonight and falling further and further behind, literally, as we sit on this Zoom? When I ran HCZ, and I'm sure Kwame and Jeff, who are watching, will attest to this, people always used to ask me, what keeps me up at night? Honestly, I wanted to say, how are you sleeping well at night, knowing how children in this country, in this community are living? None of us should be resting, resting at night. Dr. Dumpson may have had a different language, but I think that he would be calling on us to reimagine literally everything that we've done before because it has not been working for so many children in our nation. Our fresh eyes have to acknowledge that many of the systems that serve black and brown children are embedded with systemic racism as Professor Shirley said, and therefore I don't think that they can ever really in their current form achieve the outcomes that we seek. Dr. Dempson spent his entire life focused on examining the connection between policy and practice. And so we are called at this urgent moment to continue his work. Therefore, just as um, Donald said, the Dempson chair will be engaged in the process of analyzing what's working, helping to reveal what's not and making re recommendations for systemic reforms for practitioners and policymakers. Listen, while the pandemic has been so shocking to many, for the inequities and the disparities that they have been revealed. For those of us that have worked with children, we knew, we knew all along that the American dream has never been available equally to children. What I loved the most about being at the Harlem Children's Zone was Jeff used to tell us that we had a choice. We could sit around and try to convince people why there was no plan B. We needed to give kids what they needed until they didn't or we could try to, you know, or we could just do it. And Jeff used to remind us that we had a choice every day. What were we willing to do and who were we willing to do it for? So when I entitled this, this talk, New Beginnings and Reimagining Services for Children and Families, I think I was thinking about Jeff, but I was also thinking about Professor Eddie Gloud, who wrote a book that I read this summer called Begin Again about the writer James Baldwin. He called it the after time the making of a new community after destruction. I was talking to the Dean of the college at Lincoln Center and she called it the Renaissance that she hopes that comes after this time. Gloud said there are moments of crisis and moments of possibility, but it all depends on the kind of choices we make in terms of the world that we want. That is the good news. We have agency and we have choice. So in conclusion, yes, there is so much work that needs to get done, but oops, you have to go back, Liz. Go back, Liz. Thank you. There is so much work that needs to get done, but I know that we have a choice. I often talk about radical love. It's a thing that I have always relied on for my time at HCZ and ACS when I got into a hard, a hard situation. It wasn't my executive experience or my knowledge that got me through. It was my deep and abiding love for the kids and the families and my community. It was never a sacrifice. It was more like a sacrament to me. Now, it's true that my inspiration does come from a revolutionary leader from Nazareth who talked and lived a life of radical love. But I recently learned of a new concept and I wanted to share that with you tonight and leave you with it. It's from Isabel Wilkinson's book, Cast, and she called it radical empathy. She said that regular empathy is kind of putting yourselves in someone else's shoes and imagining how they would feel. But she says that radical empathy means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another one's experience from their perspective, not as you would imagine you would feel. Did you guys hear me? Radical empathy is not about you and what you think about a situation that you've never been in and probably will never be in. It is a kindred connection from a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it. Now, it may seem strange that I'm calling from radical empathy in this moment, but honestly, I believe that if policymakers and practitioners and public and nonprofit leaders, and, and now can I say faculty members since I'm at Fordham, if we do not understand that these systems need a total overhaul, even the ones that we work in, I'm not sure that any amount of research is gonna convince us. I think it's gotta come from our gut, from our spirit. 
we've got to know what are we doing now that we're going to be looking back and be sorry that we did. We have to tell the truth and have the courage to tell the truth. So let's, let's start right tonight. We must finally admit that these systems were not designed with abundance in mind. They were not designed for people that we love and respect. They were designed as if resources are scarce and as we just have to tolerate people who live in black and brown bodies. That's the opposite of radical empathy. We need to open their eyes and their hearts to know that together we can get to the after time. But we're lucky. We have Dr. Dumpson's vision as a roadmap and as a place to start. We must find a new way of being in this darkness. It reminds me of another promise of a new beginning that came after a very dark moment on the cross. But in my faith tradition, that dark moment had to happen in order to get us to the promise of salvation and a new community. So Liz, now, as I see this beautiful, this beautiful picture, and I have that quote up there, it says, each child belongs to all of us and they will bring a tomorrow in direct relation to the responsibility we have shown them. This is a picture of 4,000 beautiful people and young people from the Harlem Children's Zone who are marching for a peace march. Liz, can you go back to that la to my script, please? So why don't we imagine with new eyes to see what has never been seen before, an America where all of our children, all children are our children. As we begin to think of all of America's children as our children, the stubborn grip of poverty will loosen and our country will be lifted by the power of these children rising up. I know where I'm headed. I hope you join me in this dumps and chair as I continue to walk towards that light. Good night and thank you. And thank you so much. And thank you to both Shirley Anne, and I want to thank you for delivering such powerful presentations, for sharing of yourself a bit of your personal journey, as well as your, your research and commitment to your respective areas of study or expertise. Uh, very powerful. Thank you both. I, I will now facilitate a conversation with you both uh, and with our, all of our participants who've joined us. Uh, and I encourage everyone to submit questions via the Q&A button, again, located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, as a reminder, please kindly distinguish to whom you've uh, direct, you're directing the question, unless it uh, uh, applies to both chairs, and then we'll just uh, field it back and forth. Um, so we do have questions already, if you're ready to go. Um, we have some questions. I'm, I'll start with, and since you just uh, finished I, and, and you touched on, on a piece of, around emotional wellness, uh, there's a question that's, uh, you mentioned briefly that you did uh, work to develop an emotional wellness initiative. Can you talk a bit more about uh, it and how you think the models are, yeah. um, can, are likely to help us bring about systemic change? Thank you, um, Deborah. Um, so at the Harlem Children's Zone, our model is always about um, not just doing something for a few kids, but doing it for all kids, really thinking about scale. And we feel like when you look at changing the culture, that's how you really do sustained um, change and reform. And so we decided that when you think about things like toxic stress and trauma, we actually did um, a, a, um, a study with our young people at Promise Academy, and it was on their ACE scores, their adverse childhood experiences. And we found out that about 20%, 20, a little bit between 20 and 25% of the kids at the Hall of Children's Zone had an ACE score of four or, or above on a scale of one to 10. And we knew that that was probably a low um, uh, estimate. So what we decided to do was we wanted to incorporate it into all that we did in the organization and really um, ensure that people were thinking about what are the things that we can do to make sure that children and all of us are paying attention to our wellness, our mental health, which in the black and brown community, you know, is so taboo. So we had to kind of work it into all of the things that we were doing. So just in the way that we were concerned about our health and rates of obesity, we also wanted to pay attention to not everybody needs therapy, but maybe we need to meditate. Maybe we need to take care of ourselves. Maybe we need to make sure that we're figuring out what's happening with our emotions. And so we kind of made it mandatory that we were gonna have this discussion. We started with a set of, set of principles. My, my favorite principle is best selves to best serve because oftentimes people who come into this field wanna be martyrs and work themselves to death. And I was like, you can't work yourself to death and be there for the kids. 
And so we started with the principals, we hired a wellness team, we incorporated into all of our sites, and we put our money where our mouth was in terms of making sure that people had that time to really um, look at themselves and do the self-reflective work that they needed to do to be successful. So Deborah, the reason it was fantastic was because it was for the kids, it was for the parents, but it was also for us because many of us had very high ACE scores, right? When you talk about the trauma that we've been through. And so it was a, a, a great way for the entire community to come together. So I'm very excited about um, sharing that model with other nonprofits, especially in the child welfare. I know what caseworkers and supervisors see in that field. And so um, kind of in similar to the sanctuary model that we know of, uh, this is a, a kind of Harlem Children's Zone flavor with the, with the take for black and brown children in particular and families. Fantastic work, Anne. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm going to field a question to you, Shirley. You, you talked a lot about in your presentation, you talked a great deal about sort of the disparity, uh, particularly in early services with children between black, black and brown kids and, and white children. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the calls for justice for children up until about the 1960s. Did they focus really only on white children or how was that, how was that focus applied? Um, well, the, there may have been calls for all children, but um, there were different systems for white children and black and brown children. And um, even though we called it uh, a system needing reform for all children. And so the focus really still um, was on, on white children and what white children needed and did never really took into account just different ways of living and, um, and uh, penalized people who chose to live their lives differently um, and not conform to a standardized you know, vision. And, um, and so none of our reforms really worked because it was all about, you know, one size fitting all, um, which we know doesn't work. And um, we want so much to celebrate differences, but yet when we come to making reforms, we expect, you know, one size to fit all and that, that has never worked. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a couple of questions that can be for either of you. So maybe we'll just uh, share some pieces sure. of it. You can, you can complement each other with some answers. Um, one of the questions that came in was, how do we begin to institute new systems to help children strive, especially in education? Today with COVID, so many brown, black and Latina, Latin X are beginning to be left behind. And, and, and the participant really states that she's really fear, fearful that we're going in the wrong direction. And if you wanna start and then maybe Shirley. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I may have a different position on this. I've never, I've never thought it was about what the kids can't do. It's always about what adults weren't willing to do. And so we saw, I, I'm sorry to keep on talking about the Harlem Children's Zone, that we were able to um, really close the achievement gap with giving kids what they need, surrounding them with comprehensive services, making sure the families had all of the resources, and then putting great teachers in front of them, keeping great teachers, making sure that we have good professional development, doing constant assessments, working on Saturdays, going 11 months out of the year, making sure that we're going through the summer and really having this idea that we were gonna do whatever it takes to give children what they needed with not you know, giving, keeping the standards of what needed to happen for them and working tirelessly to get that done. I think those are the efforts that we need, Deborah, when we're working in communities that have been left behind. I mean, now I am like everybody, I'm, I am certainly worried about what COVID is doing and not being able to lay eyes on our babies is what I say and have them with us. And we know that remote learning is not what they need, but I know for sure that there are going to be educators out there that are going to be doing everything that they can in whatever way and whatever remediation that we need to, to get them back up to, to where they need to be. But it is, it's a lot, especially when you also think about the trauma that everybody, not just the kids are going to be bringing back to the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I think what Anne was, was saying is so important that it's, all of us are going through this period of trauma 
and are feeling um, very vulnerable. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring into our lives. We can be hopeful, but we really don't know what will happen tomorrow. And just knowing that we all have that vulnerability is an opportunity for us to talk about it and to open ourselves. The, you know, when, when you were talking about radical empathy, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I, I try, it was in an earlier version. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's so important for us to, uh, to put ourselves in place where other people are and to understand that we're all vulnerable and we all need to open up and talk because no one knows what's going to work. We just have to start opening dialogues and, and doing things differently. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure. One of our participants tonight is Dr. John Farrick, former uh, Dean of the Fordham Law uh, school and the founder of this, the School Center for Social Justice. And I mentioned that because I know he was a, a co-dean. He was the dean at the same time with Marianne Carranza and had great affection for her and, and great respect for the legacy of, of Dr. Dumpson. Uh, but he has, a, he has a question regarding um, children who are homeless. And could you each comment on what we should all do as individuals potentially uh, and what the government should do? And, and is this a problem that is solvable? Shirley, question. you want to start? <laughs> Shirley? No? no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Okay. She said, I mean, I, I don't, is that a trick question to ask me? Is this a problem that's <laughs> solvable? Right? I mean, this is my, they're all solvable problems. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, of course, we had children for a, a, a lot of reasons. And even in Harlem now, the rent has been really high. So a lot of families are moving to the Bronx or a lot of families are experiencing um, being doubled up with homes. We know the stress that that puts on families. We know how that affects even rates of, of child abuse and all of those kind of things. And so, I mean, I think that homeless children or children without homes, I should say, right? Because they're children, we need to put that first. Um, need what all of us need. They need a home. They need, we've found a lot of times that a place to make sure that they can study a quiet place, a place where we're kind of trying to bring down some of the chaos that is in their life so that they can, you know, have a normal life to participate in their after school programs and do all of those things that we needed to do. And for us, and I know also, um, even kids that are in foster care, if they're in foster care in other places, can we make sure that they are still getting to go to their schools because their schools provide so much stability for children? And so, I mean, I don't know that I have a policy answer to what we should be doing for homeless children in particular, but maybe if we get jobs for their parents and maybe if we make sure that their parents have a livable wage and if we make sure that we have childcare and daycare so people can go do what they need, then that would be helpful and, and um, people will be able to have the life that they need. Shirley? Yeah, well, um, you know, thank you, Dr. Freerich, for asking this question because, um, you know, homeless children and families, because children come with families or children should come with families and are, I have, has been a growing problem in New York City, not because of the pandemic, um, we have more children in shelters than we have ever had. I remember, you know, being young in the 1980s and walking through the streets and the subways, and we literally had homeless everywhere. But the city has changed in that we don't see homeless the same way, but that doesn't mean that people aren't homeless. And we've been filling shelters and hotels with children and families for the past few years. And that I, I would hope that problem is solvable, but it, we have to get to the root of the problem. What, why, why are families left with nothing but being homeless rather than just providing shelter? The problem is much more com complicated than that. And um, I guess the, pandemic has made us open our eyes and say that we really need to pay attention now. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, a question came for you, Shirley, but I'm happy to have you both jump in. At, uh, I'm sure you both have uh, uh, something to offer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question really is, what role does the, can the school play in addressing the race, ra addressing race issues, addressing uh, justice for children? Okay, well, I, I, I think that um, schools, do you mean like public schools, like children's education, or do you mean? I believe so. What, can, what, what role can schools play in addressing the, the race issue, right? You know, um, kids, kids learn to see things the way we teach them to see things, right? And families and friends and institutions such as schools help shape the way we see people and help shape the way we see in, you know, um, social situ situations that we're confronting. And schools can play a very important role in helping children learn to see other people differently, to respect, to give respect to everyone and to understand that um, we all have different histories that we carry with us and that we need to appreciate those histories and that we're all part of the problem as well as the solution. Thank you, Anne. Oh, I wasn't gonna add, any, add anything to that. I think <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that's great. Uh, well, here's one for you, Anne. How do you think Fordham is positioned to advance radical empathy within our community and in our in our neighborhoods, uh, where our campus are, and sorry, and in the <laughs> with our neighbors in the communities where our campuses are located? So another trick question, right? So the I hope everybody leaves here to know that everyone is positioned to do radical empathy. Because when Shirley talked about us being more divided than ever, it's because everyone is not necessarily listening to each other. They're trying to, you know, oh, I, well, how would I feel in that situation? When that's really not the question, the question is just to listen and to find, like I said, that kindred connection about what that person perceives about their experience. Um, Let's say, how can I say that? I think a lot of predominantly white institutions just don't do a good job of that. They come in thinking that they have the answers and that they want to help. And I just think that we all have to step back, all of us, right? And listen to what people, their experience has been. I think we need to listen to our students. I think we need to listen to staff. I think we need to listen to people in the community to see where they would like to see us partner with them. And so I know it's, it's been a very interesting time and now everybody thinks that they understand racism and they, they get systemic <laughs> racism. And so everybody's ready to go, but there's, we need to, we need, we have a lot of listening to do. And I have certainly seen it. And I think for me as a Jesuit institution, that means something to me and service and what we should be doing, especially in the Bronx. I'm so happy to be, you know, in the boogie down Bronx now. But if we look at it, are, I mean, are we proud of all of our relationships? Could we be doing more? We know how badly COVID has hit the Bronx in particular. So what role should we be playing move, moving forward, not necessarily leading, but being a better partner to the communities that we, that we serve? Terrific, thank you. Maybe one more question. Uh, Dr. Catania Gable, uh, you mentioned that you were a child of refugees, um, but what are the children who are refugees today and in, in our current context? And, and are there unique stresses and challenges that we face in finding a place in, 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 our, in their new society here in this current context? Uh, you know, we, we are a world of wanderers these days. And we're, we're wandering because we are always um, looking for better opportunities for, my, for our children. And um, whether it's here in the United States or anywhere in the world, um, refugees are different than other immigrants in that they, they have had to leave, right? And they come to places that welcome them, but don't always welcome them. Um, and, you know, we seem to be talking out of both sides of our mouth, right? So we have, 
we, you know, we, we open our country to take in refugees, but then we don't treat them very well. And we, we teach them that there's, um, you know, there are different systems for different people. And um, I think that that's something that we need to do a lot more work in that area. Um, and, you know, there's no, there's no easy answer, right? Um, but it certainly, um, and I'm thankful that we have colleagues, including at Fordham and throughout the country who specifically are looking at those issues and looking for ways um, to, to make our society more inclusive of refugees and refugee children. Thank you so much. And did you want to weigh in on that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because Shirley is the expert in that. Yeah, it's a it's a big area. She certainly yeah. is. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to I'm going to wrap us up for the evening. I I I can't thank uh, you both enough, Shirley Gatania Gable and William Zeisen, for such an engaging engaging discussion and for sharing your really extensive expertise and and critical perspectives with us. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, all of their participants for joining us for this really special occasion as we recognize our new chairs, uh, the Marianne Caranta Endowed Chair and the James R. Dumpton Endowed Chair. And uh, a special thank you to the members of the Caranta and the Dumpton family for their inspiring marks. It's really special to have the family with us. It has really made it an extra special event. Um, I thank all of our participants for joining us for sure. Uh, I know that this virtual format is not what we're used to, but I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for everyone uh, joining us this evening. We're really fortunate to be able to gather and, and advocate together really for this critical, important area of, of study and education on behalf of children. Thank All you right. both. Let's get to work. Let's get yeah. to work. And thank you, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations to you both. Thank you Thank everyone you. For, for all of your support of the Graduate School of Social Service and be well. Good Thanks. night.